So let's go ahead and jump into it. Last time we covered a lot of material. We covered the effectiveness NTU method or even the time before. Uh, and then we saw that the key to using either the log mean temperature difference for analysis of heat exchangers or the effectiveness NTU method for analysis of heat exchangers is you're going to need that overall heat transfer coefficient U. And that accounts for resistance on the one side due to convection, conduction through something, a wall, wall that may be finned or not finned, and then convection on the other side. So it's a combination of convections with conduction. So the convection correlations, we had to go back and review some convection correlations. We started out with uh, flow over knife edge plate. There's a lot of correlations dealing with uh, friction, skin friction coefficient, as well as the Nusselt number for heat transfer. Talked about the boundary layers. It was a good review of heat transfer. Talked about laminar, turbulent, transition from laminar to turbulent, characterized by the Reynolds number. Um, so there were a lot of things associated with boundary layers, Prandtl number, Reynolds number, Nusselt number, friction coefficient, and then talked about average versus local values. So there's just a plethora of correlations, and you just have to know which one is the right one. Uh, for flow inside of a pipe, forced convection, in general, the Nusselt number is a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. You need to be careful about how we evaluate uh, fluid properties and they're temperature dependent. Some of them are more temperature dependent, hence you have to be careful. How did the correlation treat temperature dependent properties? And then you have to follow that recipe for using that correlation. Okay, so if I said there was one simple equation that's in most textbooks that can be used for turbulent flow inside of a pipe that could have some roughness to it, it really wouldn't be the cider tate or the Ditas bolter correlation. Those are really simple, but they're really old and not quite as accurate. So here is an improved model that came out in the mid-70s. Uh, so I would encourage you to just, especially if you're coding up in Excel, it's not that hard. And so it can, uh, a function of uh, Reynolds number, Prandtl number, and then that friction factor really is a function of the Reynolds number and the roughness, relative roughness of the pipe. It's a range of Prandtl number, range of Reynolds number, and what's L over D greater than 10 mean? Get away from the entrance region. It's fully developed, fully developed. All right, turbulent flow. Uh, convection correlations, um, there's just a bunch of them. If you have external flow, I'm not, I thought, well, should I just repeat them all? No, they're in your textbooks. Hopefully you have both this textbook as well as the textbook for your heat transfer class that you took. Uh, so you could have flow over a round tube, a square tube, a hexagonal tube, different configurations. And a lot of them, not all of them, some people like to make one massive correlation that goes over a wide range of Reynolds number, but often they have a, a simple correlation and they'll put te a, together a table and they'll say if the Reynolds number is between you know, 0.1 and 10, or if the, it's between 10 and 1,000, or if it's between 1,000 and 10 to the 4, something like that, use this value for C and use this value for M when it's a square tube or when it's a round tube or something like that for external flow. Well, we do have many cases in heat exchangers where you have flow over not just a single tube but a tube bundle. Now, you can take a look at this. I grabbed this out of a heat transfer textbook because I thought it was a slightly clearer um, illustration. You could have different arrangements of the tubes. You could see right here that if you had this arrangement, the flow would just sort of shoot the gap, right? Just in between. Where if it's staggered, not aligned, but if it's staggered, then it's going to be forced more over the tubes, mixing and crossing back and forth. So most tube bundles are staggered especially when you have cross flow. Here is the, a bunch of uh, configurations with the C's and the M, and there's the C and there's the M on the exponent for the Reynolds number. It's for tube bundles with number of rows of 20 or greater, range of Prandtl number, range of Reynolds number where it's fixed, 
that Reynolds number is on the maximum, that would be the smallest diameter or the smallest gap. I shouldn't say diameter, smallest gap. You can get uh, heat transfer correlations as well as pressure drop correlations found in many textbooks. A lot of people have spent years collecting data, processing data, reporting the data. Natural convection, you could have it where it's not flowing because it's forced, like with a pump or a fan or a blower, and it's due to buoyancy. So it's either the Grashoff is the common parameter used, or the Grashoff times the Prandtl, which is a Rayleigh number. So you'll see a very simple form. The average Nusselt is a, a constant times the Rayleigh to an exponent n. And here it's for free convection over a horizontal circular cylinder. And the flow would go around and up. Go around and up like that. And so you see for a range of Rayleigh numbers getting stronger and stronger, higher the Rayleigh number, the stronger the natural convection. It changes the C and the M for the best fit on the data. This should be an N. Yeah, that's an N. And exponent n. Another mechanism for heat transfer. So we have flow over flat plate. You have flow inside of tubes. You have flow over the outside of tube, a single tube, a bundle of tubes. All right. You had natural convection over a surface. Let's say a horizontal cylinder, a flat plate, horizontal plate, heated, cooled, different configurations. You have another one which is very common. It's boiling. And what we uh, analyze is pool boiling. So you just put a pool liquid and you heat it on the bottom and you watch it boil like on a stove. Okay. So how many people are familiar with this diagram? Really shouldn't you need to spend time on this diagram because it's one of these where it's a classic. This is describing the behavior. So a lot of times they put this in context of uh, an experiment done by a Japanese researcher named Nukiyama. And what he had was he had a hot wire that he could pass electric current through that was inside of a, a liquid container. And liquid is basically one ATM. And he would pass more and more current through the, liquid, the, through the wire, and it would have resistive heating in the wire. The wire would get very, very hot. And as it started to heat up, he would notice that he could back out the temperature of the wire and he would see that the temperature of the wire is greater than the saturation temperature of the fluid that's ready to boil. So T surface minus T sat. And if it was maybe 2 degrees, 3 degrees, up to 5 degrees, what he did was he just saw more stronger natural convection coming off that wire, plumes. All right. But then you have the O and B. Try to guess what that acronym is for. Well, up here you have the boiling regimes. So right here, what are they saying happens be below O and B, less than five degree delta T? Just read that for me. What's that say? Free convection. It's free convection, just like I tried to describe, sort of, you know, the no changing phase. But then what do they have right here? What's that word say? Nucleate. Nucleate. Now, nucleate means like the incipient, like the beginning point, not like nuclear explosion, not that type, but nucleate. Uh, so what you have is you have little isolated what? Bubbles. And sometimes they'll just sit there and uh, sometimes if you heat it a little more, they'll grow and detach and come up off of that wire. And you would see those in particular points. They would be in particular points where it's just like in, in the pan of water that you're boiling. They like to form in kind of one point. It's a little crevice area. So if you look at the surface, you can anticipate a little crevice. And the heat makes this pretty hot right in here. It's so a bubble would like to form but it may not detach because of surface tension effects. But then if you get it a little warmer, then it likes to expand, then it likes to pop, and then another bubble forms in the same spot, and then it comes off the surface. And so you're having these nucleate at particular locations forming formation of bubbles, and then the bubbles can come up. So you have 
those bubbles. And then what happens here? What's this? You're just, as you increase the heat transfer, electric current through the wire, the amount of heat generated off that wire, you'll get more sites that have bubbles, and those that were there will be issuing them in a stream, jetting up. Pop, 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 pop. You can see that on your boiling water, too. They'll start coming up from that location. Well, what happens here, I forgot to talk about what's happening on the y-axis. What is on the y-axis? It's a flux, heat flux, isn't it? So it's kind of a funny axis, really, for pool boiling. Uh, they have the excess temperature on the x-axis and on the y-axis how much flux. So as you had a little bit of just natural convection, what you find is that as you increase the excess temperature, yeah, you get some increase and the slope is so much. You're increasing the flux, heat removal from that surface. But once you hit the onset of nucleate boiling, you're starting to get those little pockets of vapor form, detach, come off, liquid rushes back in, it's replenishing, it's cooling that surface or picking up heat from that surface, some of it vaporizes and away it goes. You get much steeper curve, don't you? And so what you're getting is, is you're getting a greater flux for every one degree increase in the excess temperature of the surface. It, it, some things are just fun, they're just fun. And then what happens when you really crank this up? Because look at the scale. What is the scale on the y-axis? Linear? Is it a linear scale? You have 10 to the 2, 10 to the 4, 10 to the what? 5. Did they skip 10 to the 3, or is that 10 to the 3 on the bottom? All right, 10 to the 3 on the bottom, and then it goes up. So what scale is that? Log. So it really is increasing. The flux is tremendously increasing as it goes up. All right. So it's also a large scale on the excess temperature, isn't it? So what happens is the temperature is 10, then all of a sudden it's greater. It hears up the brown, what is that, 30? 30 degrees excess temperature. And what happens here? for this particular surface with this particular fluid at that particular pressure, but it's a characteristic curve that's common no matter what fluid you're boiling, is you get a tremendously high heat flux, but you hit something called MAX, don't you? Get the maximum heat flux. For what? For nucleate boiling. You're getting a lot of bubbles generated over a large area of the surface. Well, if you keep cranking up the flow, this is what Nukiyama did, he would say, okay, keep boosting the voltage across the wire. That forces more current through. That makes more resistive heating. And then all of a sudden, things would get so exciting that it would go, and his wire would fry. Well, what happened? It happened real fast in the experiment. Well, the bubbles started to cover more and more percentage of the wire. Liquid couldn't get back in to bring in its high conductivity and bring in, you know, to re heat removal mechanism. If it's covered with a layer of vapor by bubbles, what's the conductivity, the thermal conductivity of vapor compared to the conductivity of a liquid? The same material. Vapor is much lower. V liquid's much higher. So, Right away, the heat removal mechanism faltered, and what happens is, is the wire would fry, and he'd get frustrated. He'd get a better wire. I think he got some nickel, what does it say, chromium or some other wire that could take really high temperatures without melting, and he did his experiment again and again until it was able to withstand after the whole wire was covered in a vapor. Not good for heat transfer but very interesting to explore. So what happened was it jumped across, and now you had a huge temperature difference. See, I picked up that word from our presidential candidates. Huge, huge. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and what happens is the flux stayed at that maximum. It's tremendous. Now, normally that would burn out the wire in the experiment. 
But here, what you have now is you jumped over and you got rid of poo boiling and you went to film boiling. What does that mean? You have just a vapor film, and now the heat has to transfer through that vapor film before it gets to the liquid, before it's swept away. And that creates a high resistance, a high delta T. Now, what they did was once they were able to do that, then they could control the heat remove, heat addition, and lower back that voltage and very carefully walk it back into this area. And then they would hit another flux, and at this point right here, if they tried to lower it some more without any really good control, it would jump back that way. Boom. So it was kind of an exciting and good experiment. But then with high uh, speed controllers, not too high, but better controllers, they're able to actually walk into this no man's land, which is very difficult to do. <laughs> very difficult to do, but it's not something that's practical. What's practical is you want to boil uh, below the critical heat flux. You want to boil in that uh, nucleate boiling regime, good heat transfer with the low delta T. And if you're over here at the pool boiling, maybe you don't want boiling. Maybe you want to knock it off, you know, but you're, it's, it's a large delta T. So there could be some applications where you're forced to be do, do things in the film boiling out here with the nucleate. So that's heat, uh, a little uh, discussion of a, a boiling. Condensation's the opposite. The key to condensation is, is once you have a cold surface, and the vapor is going to want to flow to it, you want to get the liquid formed, and then you want to get the liquid off. And so you want to get it to uh, form droplets and then shed the droplets. Um, if you could get a surface where the droplets don't like to create a film on the surface, but actually coalesce to a big drop, Let's say if I'm looking at it like this, and the drop, even though in the presence of gravity, the drop holds right here until it grows, and then it'll slide off. And when it slides off, it takes with it everybody below. It's like a domino effect. Ping, 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 grows and falls off. And if you could get where the most of the surface was what we call dry, and you're condensing on that surface, that's the best. That's the best. But it's really hard to achieve in practical considerations because uh, things get messed up. There's a little, little film on that surface that will just mess it up. And so you would want to have the drop-wise condensation, but often we have film condensation. So the whole thing is wet, and then it's like sheets coming down, rivulets, and then dripping off. All right. Um, the condensation... Let me see, there was one other thing I was going to mention. Yeah. So let's say I, I'm trying to condense water vapor, H2O. And you, so this is the vapor here, and then here's the liquid. But what happens in our systems when we usually start them up? There's some impurities in there. So what do you think is going to be pretty ubiquitous in a power plant, and especially in a condenser of a power plant? You're going to have a little air in there. Okay, what exactly is air? It's nitrogen primarily and oxygen, and it's not going to be good for the performance because what's going to happen if I'm going to have a cold surface, let's say a cold tube in my condenser, and I have a little air? Where's the, is the air going to be equally distributed throughout the condenser, or is it going to preferably pile up somewhere? It's going to pile up, isn't it? And where is it going to pile up? right where you're trying to get the water vapor to go. And so you'll get this zone or layers of high density or higher density than you want, non-condensable, that are interfering with the vapor flow to the surface, the cold surface, so that it'll condense. So you have to sweep off in a power plant and get the non-condensables, the air, out of the system through some tricks blow it off, suck it off. Sometimes a psh, you hear that shooting, psh, try to get rid of it off of the system. So whenever you have condensation and you have to think a little bit about, you don't want it in there, but sometimes it gets in there and you got to keep it out, work hard. Fouling. So there, here I have a surface for heat transfer and then junk just gets on it. And so there's an added resistance. 
So if I'm doing the 1 over UA, the overall resistance, and I'm describing a 1 over the convection coefficient on the inside, area of the inside, 1 over convection coefficient outside, area outside, and some resistance conduction, I'll put it L over Ka. What you can have is you can have some additional resistance due to the fouling on the inside, and you can have some resistance fouling on the outside. You could have both. Maybe one of them is dominant. Maybe, maybe you have a refrigerant um, uh, 134A on the inside of the tube, and then you have uh, water that's going up to your cooling tower and then back down on the outside. Well, uh, the water would typically get dirty, and so you'd have fouling on one side more than the other. So as a design engineer, often you think about fouling, and you think, well, what we're going to have to do is service the equipment, so every now and then, maybe once every year, once every two years, we're going to shut it down, evacuate, pull off the end caps, and clean our heat exchangers. And it's a lot easier to clean the inside of tubes than the outside of tubes. So often what they do is they have the water run not through the inside, but they'll have the refrigerant on the outside and the dirtier water on the out inside of the tube, and that's the surface that'll get fouled, and then they'll just run a little brush. You can see it already. Just run it down, a little tube cleaner. And the technicians, or whoever this guy's job is, he'll spend a, a week running it down each one of those tubes and cleaning it out. But fouling is a real practical thing. Unfortunately, it's a lot of heuristics depends on what type of conditions are out there and junk that's in your fluid stream. Thinned surfaces, this is the last topic before we solve a problem. So when you want to promote the heat transfer from a surface, then you want typically add fins. What do they do? Well, you look at the equation Q is equal to HA delta T. If I want to promote the heat transfer, either I boost the delta T, often that's not an option. You can take it up so much, but then you're limited. Or I motivate the flow. I have a pump. I have a fan. I blow the, so I can have more higher um, velocity of the fluid, a thinner boundary layers, more heat transfer. But then you sort of run out of that option, too. The other option is to somehow get more area. And that's what finning does. Thinning increases the contact area between the fluid and the solid. So, how many people remember fins, heat exchangers? Yeah, remember it? Good. And so what we're going to do is we're going to solve a problem that we'll have to analyze fins. So instead of introducing the equations right now, I'll introduce them as we go. So for the rest of the class, we'll, we'll solve this problem. So you have a commercial steel pipe, and the thermal conductivity of the steel is 25. And right away, when you see that word commercial steel, we came out of chapter one, we're thinking, hey, I know the roughness. I can look up the roughness of the inside of this pipe, okay, if I need it. And it has a 16 copper fins attached to promote heat transfer on the outside. Well, I'm not certain how they attach the copper to the commercial steel, but we're going to deal with copper fins on a steel tube. So here's an illustration. This part right here is one of the copper fins, true? What is all of this in here? That's our steel. So they have much different conductivities, 25 BTUs per hour foot degree F versus 225 for the copper. Okay. So they added the copper fins. They say they added 16. I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But this would be then 9 all the way back around to 16, wouldn't it? So there's 16 of them. They're showing you half of the, the top half of it. Okay. Now they ask a question. How long must the pipe be in order for the liquid to exit at 175 degree F. So on the outside of the tube you have gas, on the inside of the tube you have a liquid flowing. So 
This is the direction of the liquid flow. It's kind of into the paper, you know, actually through it. And they tell you in the, all this data properties like velocity of the liquid in the inside, what's that specific heat of the liquid, the viscosity, the density, the kinematic viscosity, the thermal conductivity, the Prandtl number, and what's that? The temperature of the liquid that comes in. So it comes in at 200 degrees F. Is that our mean inlet temperature of the fluid? Yeah, that's our mean inlet temperature of the fluid. And it, they want to know how long it needs to be, so we need to find the length L such that the te temperature out is 175 degrees F. All it did was cool it by 25 degrees F. Does that problem make sense, what we're trying to do? Let's take a look at what we have on the air side or the gas side. We have the average convection coefficient on the air side. Did they give us the convection coefficient on the inside? No, but you can see they probably gave you enough information to calculate it, and we're probably going to have to calculate it. But this is nice that they gave us the convection coefficient on the outside. They give us, what is this, density of the air on the outside, the specific heat, constant pressure, air outside, the ambient temperature of the air on the outside, 32 degrees F. So that's cool. So right away, you might think about the liquid is the hot side, and the gas is the cool or cold side. True? Heat is flowing out the hot liquid into the cooler gas. Let's take a look at this property, dynamic or absolute viscosity, the thermal conductivity, and the Prandtl number, if we need them. So, how are we going to solve this problem? Let me stop, pause, because I'm a believer in active learning. And I want to see what you can do. What is your overall strategy to calculate L? I tried to describe everything. If you have a piece of paper, try to show me how you're going to calculate L. All right, so the basic question is, is somebody said, I'm going to have to calculate H on the inside. To do what with? Well, probably going to get H on the outside and all that. I'm going to get the U, the overall heat transfer code. Yeah, but what are you going to do with that? You know what? I recall UA is some sort of overall, 1 over UA is some overall resistance to my heat transfer. So I'm going to use that because you can tell that A is related to L. If I have a longer length, I'm going to have more A, isn't it? And now, where do you see this UA come in anything? It's a heat exchanger. Heat exchanger. So could I use, we're analyzing a heat exchanger. What methods do we use for analyzing heat exchanger? Effectiveness NTU as well as the log mean temperature difference. I'm going to say that the effectiveness NTU method works. It can be applied for this heat exchanger to help us pick the length to size the heat exchanger. So now, start working on parts of the effectiveness NTU method. It's as if, as if Remember that if I wanted to rate a heat exchanger, I would use effectiveness as a function of number of transfer units. If I wanted to size a heat exchanger, the number of transfer units is a function of the effectiveness. But I have a different styles of heat exchangers. I have cross flow, I have concurrent pipes and uh, parallel flow and counter flow, and I have a bunch of different types of heat exchangers, you know, shell and tube, single pass, double pass. Isn't this it? I need to get that number of transfer units, right? Is this, sizing the... this is the rate, and this is more of the size. To size it, yeah. Because what's embedded in NTU? The area. And the area is the length, proportional to the length. Okay. Can you get the effectiveness? And then can you tell me what equation or correlation, if given the effectiveness, I do this, calculate the function, so I get back the NTU for this heat exchanger. All right.
I need to find out if I can calculate the effectiveness. But what is the effectiveness? It's the Q over Q maximum. Well, can I calculate the, the actual rate of heat transfer from the information given? Well, it's going to be the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid because they told us the information about the velocity of the hot fluid going down the tube, and they told us what the temperature of the hot in and the temperature of the hot out. It's all on the liquid side that allows us to get the actual Q. So what is the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid? That's the mass flow rate of the hot times the specific heat of the hot. The mass flow rate of the hot, well, it's a little bit of work because they gave you the velocity, but they give you the density, the velocity, and now you have to get the cross-sectional area, pi d squared over 4. Isn't that the cross-sectional area? So I calculate the mass flow rate of the hot fluid. It comes in at 5.0194 pound mass per second. I then multiply by the specific heat of the hot fluid, and I calculate that it's 5.0194 BTUs per second degree F. <coughs> I then say, what is the temperature hot in? 200. What is the temperature hot out? 175 was our requirement. So what is our actual Q? Our actual Q comes in at 125.5 BTUs per second. I'm halfway there to get the effectiveness. I need now get Q max. Uh, what is Q max? I forgot an effectiveness sent to you method. It's C min, the minimum heat capacity rate, times the highest of the high temperatures, hot in, and the cold in, the lowest of the low temperatures. But I look back at my problem. The cold, you said this was a heat exchanger. It's obviously a heat exchanger. But is the cold fluid changing temperature? Is there a cold in and a cold out? Is there a mass flow rate of the cold? None of that's given. But look at the numbers. It's like the cold in is equal to the cold out. What type of mass flow rate of the cold fluid would allow that in a heat exchanger to happen? The cold in is equal to cold out. There's only one cold temperature. High, high mass flow. And that's a key observation. So what you do is you say, you know, this cold fluid has like a huge, like that word. I love that word. But after the elections, I'm going to disperse with that word. Uh, the high, high, high mass flow rate. So the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid is, guess what? much, much greater than the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid. Because the hot fluid doesn't change. I'm sorry, the, I got it backwards, didn't I? The cold is the, the cold has the high uh, mass flow rate. It doesn't change temperature. It stays 32. And so it's much, much greater than the hot. So what has the minimum heat capacity rate? The hot fluid. Did we just Calculate the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid? Sure did. Is there a way to calculate the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid, the fluid that doesn't change temperature, the air? You could just say it's infinity. It's in infinity. That's right. It's just much, much greater. And so this is going to be then times the temperature hot in, which is 200. We know that one. 200 minus the 32. True? All right. So the Q max comes in at 843.3 BTUs per second. How does that compare with the Q actual? Hey, we can calculate the effectiveness now. 125.5 divided by 843.3. The effectiveness comes in at 0 0.1488, about 15%. You needed that for the effectiveness NTU method. And you already identified the correct correlation. That correlation works when C sub R, the, what is C sub R? The ratio, the minimum C min to C max is equal to zero. And we just said C max is for the gas side. It's infinity. It doesn't change temperature. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's for the gas side. It doesn't change temperature. So we're going to use that one. Okay. 
So what we find is that the number of transfer units is equal to the natural log of 1 over 1 minus the effectiveness. Do you agree? Yeah, that looks good. Isn't it good? So we, we plug that in and we say, hey, the number of transfer units that's needed is 0 0.16112. Okay, quick, quick, quick question. What are the SI units on effectiveness? Dimensionless. What are the units on NTU? Dimensionless. But the NTU is defined as U A over C min. So finally, ah, that's where my length is in the area, isn't it? So what I do is I say I know what the number of transfer units is. So A is equal to, or put UA, UA is equal to C min times number of transfer units. I know what C min is, that's the hot. I know what the number of transfer units is, 0.16, blah, 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 blah. So we calculate that UA needs to be 0 0.80873 BTUs per second degree F. A lot of work. A lot of work to find out what UA needs to be. Now we go get U. All right. So let me do. That's right. So 1 over UA, what we just calculated, comes from resistance to convection on the inside, 1 over H inside, area inside. Resistance to conduction through the steel wall. Let's look back at our figure. We're going to move from this temperature to that temperature. The inside temperature, the outside temperature of the steel wall. All right. So I would say that's going to be, maybe I should do it like this. Resistance convection on the inside plus resistance conduction through the wall plus now I think about this. Mm, I would say just convection off the outside, but I have thin surfaces helping it. I have thin surfaces helping it. So what I can do to help do this correctly is I can think of a network. I'm going to have the temperature of the liquid on the inside, the temperature of the wall on the inside. What is the resistance here? The convection inside. Then I'm going to have the temperature of the wall on the outside. What is that resistance? That's the resistance of the conduction through the wall. But now, thinking about it, I have I can go into the fin and then into the fluid, or right off of the bare part of that outside surface, true? So what you do is you say, hmm, I could go this way to get into the, the gas or the air, or I could go this way. So they're not in series, it's like through the fin and into the fluid, or just off of the surface that's bare. So this would be the resistance through fin. You could say, well, I know how to calculate it through one fin. Great. If you have one fin, then here's another fin, then there's another fin, then there's another fin. Guess how many fins are all in? Is that parallel or series? I get confused. Parallel, parallel. I got 16 fins. Likewise, I could have 16 bare spots. 16 of them, 16 bare spots or 16 little fins. They're all, all of them in parallel, going between two temperature nodes, the temperature on the wall on the outside and the temperature of the fluid on the inside. Okay, let me do this. Which one do you think is easier, the little bare segment or with the fin? The bare segment. The bear segment. So the resistance for the bear part, that's just going to be 1 over the H on the outside times the area bear. Isn't it? So you could say, I'm going to, I can just sum up the 16 little segments of bear. 
uh, that would be it, or I can put each one as a separate area, and then I'll have 16 resistors for the bear and carry, sum them in parallel. I'll let you show to yourself that they are mathematically the same. So this area bear is equal to 2 pi r2. Go back to the illustration. I'm going to have an r1 and an r2. So the circumference is 2 pi r2 or 2 pi d2, either way. So this is d2, and that's d1, d1, d2, okay. So uh, it's either 2 pi r2 or, or pi d2, depending how you want to do it, minus how much was covered up. And how many were covered up? We had 16 that were covered up. And, and, and what is the thickness of each one that's covered up? Point, point 0.1 inch, that's right, right up here, point 0.1 inch, very good. So 16T, 16T, that makes sense? So let's not get too many equations down here. Multiply by, what is L? Um, what I'm trying to calculate, the length, isn't it? I got the circumference, the length, but if I multiply by L, that gives me the area for the bear. So right away, you can see that uh, you're going to find these L in each of these terms. Let me show for this one. This resistance on the convection on the inside, 1 over H inside, pi D inside L, the same L. How about the resistance conduction through the wall? That's going to be natural log D, I shouldn't say inside, I think I called that D1, D2 over D1 or R2 over R1, 2 pi conductivity of the steel, L. True? All right, and then uh, all of these resistors, I'm just going to put them all into one resistor right here. And so that resistor is, is the resistance bare, 1 over H outside, the, the um, area bare, which is 1 over H outside. Oh boy, i got to rewrite all that. Uh, pi D2 minus 16TL. So each one of these has the resistances something over L, something over L, something over L for that one right there. What do you think the resistance of due to 16 fins is going to be? Something over L. All right. So let me pause for a minute. Either we can go get H of I, or we can get what is the resistance through one fin. Let's do the one fin first. Is that OK? So let's analyze one fin. So what is our fin equation? Here's our fin. First of all, what type of fin is it? Rectangular fin that goes the length of the, the, length of the tube. Okay, So it's going way, way back like that. L is the distance it goes back, right? OK. And its thickness is T. So we recall our fin equation, Q through the fin is equal to square root of H P K A C times the hyperbolic tangent of a fin parameter known as M times a corrected length times T surface, uh, I'm sorry, the temperature at the base of the fin, which is this temperature right here, temperature of the base of the fin, uh, often they put TB or something like that, TB, minus the temperature of the fluid. And then you say, okay, now i got to calculate all these things. i got to calculate the, the, the H is given. Isn't the H equal to 6? What is it, BTUs? BTU, let's say that the H is given in the problem statement. Okay, so a lot of times I look a little check mark. Got it. What's that P? P is the perimeter. Perimeter is, in this problem, 
2L plus 2T. I suspect that L is long compared to T, so I can approximate that as 2L. I can neglect 2T. K, which is K right there? Is that the conductivity of the fluid, the gas, or the conductivity of the copper? It's the copper. Good, very good. That's given. How about A sub C? That's that section for it to transfer out from the base toward the tip, that cross-sectional area. What is that equal to? L times T. Perfect. So what you do is this term, the square root of HP case A, is equal to um, the square root of H. The P is 2L. Then you have the K of the copper. Then you have LT. True? So guess what? That L and that L is where you get the L out. And so this, this translates into L times the square root of 2HK of the copper thickness. All right, let's continue. Uh, what is M? M is the square root of HP divided by K of the copper area cross-sectional area. Well, you do the same thing. You say, what was P again? That was approximately 2L. What was, that's a K of the copper. What's the area? L times T. So in the parameter M, the L's cancel, and now we can calculate that parameter M for this problem. The parameter M comes in at 2.53 inverse feet. What is L sub C? Well, it's the length of the fin. Oh boy, I just realized I have two L's that are conflicting. This is the, the I know, it's, it's this length plus the thickness over two because you want to use this equation, which is an insulated tip thin equation. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. I guess I should have used another symbol for the, the length of that fin, but they do use L. It's very, very common. L is the length of the fin, so let's jump back here and say, what is this L of the fin? Maybe I should put a subscript F on it. L sub F, length of the fin, not length of the pipe. <laughs> so what is the length of the fin? Well, it's five inches outside to outside. It's two inches outside here, here. So that leaves three inches, but it's one side and one side. So what is the length of the fin? Length of the fin. It's uh, 1.5 inches plus 0 0.01. No, 0 0.1, isn't it? 0.1 inch divided by 2. So that's what the length, the corrected length is for the fin. So we, we uh, can take the hyperbolic tangent. So, so this equation comes down to the hyperbolic tangent of M L sub C. We just did M. We just put L sub C in there. And then we have the T B minus T infinity. Okay, so this is the Q of the fin. Let me rewrite this. Sorry, I have to scoot down a little bit. So QF1 over L is equal to TB minus T infinity, or maybe I shouldn't do it, leave it like this. Um, 1 over all of that stuff. L square root 2HK copper T hyperbolic tangent to M L sub C, all that. Because really that's, that's like a, a, a resistor. So uh, if I call this the resistance for one fin, then I can bring that L up here. L times the resistance one fin is equal to all that. Okay, let me go back to the diagram. So I just have the resistance of one fin, but I need to calculate, I need to combine them. How do we combine resistors? We have one over the resistance of all fins is equal to um, 
the the sum of one over the resistors of one fin, which there's 16 of them, so sum over 16 terms, which is 16 times the resistance of one fin. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So the resistance of all the fins, all 16 of them, is equal to the resistance of one fin divided by 16 because they're all equal resistances all right and that resistance of one fin was l times square root and i have to go back and refresh my memory square root 2hk t hyperbolic tangent 2hk t hyperbolic tangent of MLC, and then you divide that by 16, true? So finally, we collapse that down to one resistor, right? And that one resistor for all the fins is equal to um, um, resistance of all of them. Oh, I just messed that up. This is, this is all down here, isn't it? Isn't it 1 over 16, blah, 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 blah? I'm sorry, I'm trying to work on too many pages here. Um, the resistance is 1 over all of that, not all of that. Sorry. So what you have is all of that is one resist. So you, you pick up the 1 over 16. I'm getting tired of writing it all. 2HKT hyperbolic tangent of MLC 1 over L. Notice it's the 1 over L again, the 1 over L, the 1 over L, the 1 over L. All right. So let me put some of these numbers down to help you. Because uh, you have three resistors. You'll have, am I running out of time? Close enough. I'm going to say that the L times the resistance of convection on the inside comes in at about 0. 0.00095. Then we add to that the L times resistance of conduction through the steel. And that comes in to be 0. 0.00085. Each of these have the same units. Uh, I'll put the units right here. The units are uh, foot degree F hour per BTU. And then we're going to have the resistance of the equivalent of the two resistors, finned and unfinned, that were in parallel. We can combine those. And when you combine them, you get that it's uh, 0 0.03803. When you sum them up, you have the total resistance 0 0.3983. The units all have the same. So when I go back, I like to look and see, well, what percent of the resistance was due to convection on the inside, a whopping 2.4%, almost negligible. How about 2.1% through the wall of the steel, and then 95.5% due to the getting it into the air after it's already on the outer surface of the rod of the tube. So that's why they thinned it to try and reduce that resistance, but it's still the dominant resistance. It's still the dominant resistance. Okay. So, um, so what we have is uh, the the uh, total length is equal to U A times L times resistance total overall. This was zero point three. Nope. Sorry. Zero point. 03983 units of foot degree F hour per BTU. That's what we just calculated right there. 
And then the UA that I needed, that we said from a heat exchanger analysis, is 0 0.808715 units of BTU per second degree F. There's just one unit conversion factor we have to be careful of. 3,600 seconds is an hour. Otherwise, the length is computed correctly, and the length comes in to be 116 feet. If I want it shorter, what do I have to do? Do something with that air side. It's, it's stopping the heat transfer. The one thing I didn't do is I didn't uh, show you how to get H. Did I show how to get H inside? Yes, sir. Sure. sure. No, that L times the R total from the combination of two resistors that are in uh, parallel, the thin, the 16 thin and the 16 bare surfaces. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm confused on how, like, is that L a variable? Does it not cancel out with that other L? Uh, okay, come back here. Yeah, well, we had a couple L's, and sorry about that. This L truly is how long it needs to be. The fin length is the same as the pipe length. So over here, it's the L that, yes, I need that L, not the L of the fin. This is the L. But when I came over here to calculate uh, the, cor the corrected length, I need this length of the fin, length of the fin plus the half thickness divided by two. That's how long the fin sticks out. Then I have to be very careful because I'm recycling L. And that L is needed for this hyperbolic tangent of M, a parameter, times the corrected length. So um, uh, when you have these two L's right here, they come out. So I have Q is equal to L, blah, 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 blah. And then when I come down here, it's, it's this resistance. I should have left it right there. Put the L there. And then so this is the resistance of one fin, 1 over L times oh that. And this L sub C is the corrected length of the fin, not to be confused with the length of the tube. All right. Um, <clears throat> did I do the Nusselt? No. But basically, um, you, I think you can do the, the calculation on the convection coefficient on the inside. That was probably the easiest of them. And uh, the convection coefficient on the inside, H on the inside, I think it came in to be around 2,300 BTU per hour foot squared degree F. Quite high convection coefficient on the inside. I used the correlation that I showed earlier. I used this correlation. So you've got to get the friction factor. You've got to get the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number for the water on the inside. Get the Nusselt number, and then get the convection coefficient. The, the heat transfer coefficient for the, uh, for the going to the that was already given? Yeah, that's given in the problem statement, and uh, that is right here. And the only thing to really promote heat transfer is to try and blow a fan over that or promote that air heat transfer to get that H up because that's what's dominating the resistance. Thank you very much. You have a long homework problem due next time. It's very similar to this.